Well, I have my helper back here, don't I? Hi, Juno. Have you come to read with me? Give me a kiss, then go back to the couch. Okay, go on, sweetheart. Okay, that one stopped rather abruptly, part one. Um, so, there we are. It's um, night. It's a gale. I'm trying to back up onto this little boat to save it. I shoved the gears into forward and slammed both throttles to their stops, yelling for Rob to watch out. Because Arbiter was so much heavier, she didn't respond as quickly to the wave. Just as our propellers bit, and we started to move forward, I looked behind and saw the radon shoot down the wave and slam into us with a resounding crash, and Avta shuddered from the blow. Rob had managed to scramble out of the way and was shaken but not hurt. The night was pitch black, the wind was howling, the rain was pelting, and I thought we had been holed. From my position at the helm, looking back, it appeared that his steel anchor roller had pierced us below the waterline. All I could think was that we would likely sink in a few minutes. Are we hold, Rob? I screamed at him, my voice battling the wind. He ran to the stern and looked over as the boat bucked and reared in the steepening waves. Yes, he yelled back. Yes, we are. Is it below the waterline? I screamed again. I don't know. It's hard to tell in these waves. Wait. Okay, I can see it now. It's about a foot above the waterline, about the size of my fist. I scrambled quickly to the stern, shone my torch over, and saw a five-inch hole with jagged fiberglass around it. But it was higher than the red anti-fouling paint, which meant it was above the waterline. I, I felt relieved, although a lot of water could still flood in. I looked around for the radon and saw it about a hundred yards off, its lights dimming as the batteries lost power. I had to get to him before his lights went out, or it will be impossible to find him again. Excuse me. I quickly opened the engine room hatches and saw about six inches of water sloshing around the bilge. I shone my torch into the bilge pumps and could see that they were working, sucking water over the side, staying ahead of the incoming flow. I slammed the hatch closed and jumped back inside to the wheel. Okay, Rob, I'm going back to him. We've got one shot. I'm going to call him on the VHF and get him on deck. As soon as you can, toss him the line, then yell at me when he has it, okay? <clears throat> Rob looked scared and was shaking but he coiled the tow line and positioned himself. I called the fisherman on the VHF and he agreed with my plan. <coughs> Excuse me. As I circled back through the waves, I could see him make his way from his tiny cabin out to the bow of his boat, keeping low. I reversed up to him and Rob leaned over and extended the pole with the tow line attached to it. I had assumed he would have disconnected the pole and just tossed the line to the fisherman, but he hadn't. The pole was snatched out of his hand with the desperation of a drowning man clutching a straw. I thought that the cliché was appropriate in these circumstances. The fisherman detached the line and tossed the pole aside. Leaning over the bow, he quickly attached the tow clip, gave a thumbs up, and edged his way back into his cabin. From arrival on site to hookup had taken about 20 minutes. With Rob paying out the tow line, I glanced at the radar. We were less than half a mile from the reefs off Fraser Point. I looked at the depth sounder. It showed only 16 feet. We were in immediate danger of being swept ashore, and in these conditions, none of us would survive. I yelled at Rob to secure the tow line as we needed to get out of there fast. He shouted back that we were ready to go. I gave the boat some throttle, and the sound of the engines increased. I was glued to the radar, watching to see us edge away from the land. It wasn't happening. I thought for a panicked moment that we were caught in a strong current that swept around Fraser Point and was pulling us relentlessly towards the rocks. Reaching down to give us maximum throttle, I noticed that I had neglected to put the gear controls 
from neutral to forward. Feeling stupid but relieved, I jam the throttles back to idle, push the gear levers forward and move the throttles quickly back to 1200 RPM. With eyes back on the radar, I watch the island, very slowly moving away. But it was soon apparent that the wind and waves were combining to push us southeast back towards the rocks. I alter course to the northwest and push the throttles up another 200 revolutions. The next 10 minutes were spent intently staring at the radar, GPS and the depth sounder to determine our speed and course. We slowly clawed our way off the dangerous lee shore and I punched in the coordinates for Santa Barbara Harbor. Oops! Santa Barbara Harbor! Our destination. It was now just past midnight and the GPS showed that at our rate of speed, about five knots, we'd be off the entrance to the harbor at about 5.15 a.m. I radio Coast Guard Long Beach and informed the competent woman who'd been my liaison on this dark, stormy night that I had the office in tow and was proceeding to Santa Barbara. She acknowledged my call with relief, thanked me for my assistance, and requested that I let them know when we were safely tied up in harbor. I called a fisherman whose boat was being tossed around behind us as we both shouldered the high seas that were hitting us abeam. He said he was okay, relieved to be out of there. I put the boat on autopilot, patted her wheel affectionately and let out a big sigh of relief. I looked over at Rob, who was wet and cold. We leaned over and high-fived each other. Then I suggested he get into some warmer clothes. We were both coming down from the adrenaline high that had been keeping us going all night. About 1.30 in the morning, the wind seemed to lessen and the seas smoothed out, and although they were still quite high, at least they were no longer so vicious. Rob pulled out his harmonica, played a couple of blues tunes, and then asked if he could catch some sleep. He crawled into the bunk, pulled the blanket over him, and slept for an hour. When he awoke... I slept for about 45 minutes and felt a little better. Looking behind, we could see the faint outline of the office as she rolled along behind us with the, with the tow rope slackening and tightening. The lamb was getting closer both on the radar and visually as the lights of Santa Barbara became clearer. The last time I had entered this narrow and winding harbor entrance was four months previously and I had never done it at night. I studied and restudied my large-scale chart. Ten minutes before we reached the end of Stern's Wharf, I wrapped up warm, left the cabin, and climbed the steps to the flybridge. In the lee of the land, the wind was light and the seas were calm, a noticeable difference from the witch's cauldron of just a few hours ago. I radioed Santa Barbara Harbor Patrol on Channel 12 to let them know that I'd be towing in a disabled vessel. The patrolman informed me that the dredge was positioned at the harbour entrance, but there were numerous buoys and I should just follow the arrows. I thanked him, slowed the boat down, and Rob shortened up the tow line. I switched off the autopilot and turned the wheel to the left. Nothing happened. Well, not exactly nothing. There was a lot of clicking noise. The wheel spun lightly in my hand, but the boat would not go in the direction I needed to. It was still dark, and remembering the layout of the bay, I knew we would drift into the, into the anchorage and eventually onto the beach. I would have set the anchor if necessary to prevent this. Feeling a bit foolish, I called Santa Barbara Harbor Patrol again, told him of my predicament and requested assistance. He responded immediately, and within five minutes came alongside. I informed the office over the radio that we had no steering. He thought it quite apropos to the events of the night, and it was obvious in his voice that he was happy to be in calm waters after his ordeal. We gathered in our tow line, and I maneuvered out of the way using just the twin throttles. Harbour Patrol hooked up to the radon and slowly towed it through the very narrow winding entrance into the harbour. I followed him in, steering by using the two engines. He secured the office alongside a commercial dock and I spun our boat against the guest dock and walked over to thank the patrolman. He introduced himself as Brian and said he was glad of the opportunity to be of assistance. It had been a boring night. I went around to meet the fisherman, Luke, 
to do the necessary paperwork. When he climbed out of his boat, he looked me right in the eye, shook my hand hard and long, and thanked me sincerely. As he was a member of Vessel Assist, the 12-hour job cost him nothing. Had he not been a member, the towing bill would have been over $1,600. I retrieved my hook pole and staggered back to my boat. Dawn was just breaking. The gale had blown itself out. I climbed onto the flybridge, fired up the trusty Caterpillar diesels and jockeyed off the dock using my throttles. As I motored down the fairway, I noticed that the red light on the autopilot panel was blinking. I pushed the engage button. The light stayed steady. I pushed it again and the light went out. I turned the wheel and it responded as if nothing had happened. I had my steering back. <clears throat> I radioed the Coast Guard in Long Beach to let them know that the office was secure. They thanked me for my efforts on behalf of Luke and congratulated me on a job well done. The next hour and a half were glorious. The sun came up, the visibility was endless, the sky was gorgeous, the seas behind us with a three to four foot swell. Rob played his harmonica as we surfed our way back to Ventura, occasionally yelling with delight when we caught a wave perfectly and rode it long, with spray hissing over the foredeck. I called Joelle on the VHF, and it was obvious that it had been a sleepless night for her. She had kept the radio on, and had heard the communications between the Coast Guard and me. She was anxiously awaiting my voice. It felt good to hear her, and there is no doubt both she and Mum were relieved. Half an hour before Ventura Harbour entrance, I climbed onto the flybridge, switched off the autopilot and surfed through the entrance just for the sheer thrill of it. I felt good about saving Luke and his boat. I had learned a tremendous amount about Alpta, the area, and my capabilities, and I was hungry. Dave called me on the radio, sounded happy that all went well, and invited us to Christie's for breakfast as soon as we tied up. As we motored to our slip, several boats in the harbour tooted their horns for us. We found out later that a lot of boats had been listening to our ordeal on the VHF radio that night. Dave had spent a restless night himself, for having just moved his VHF radio, having just moved, his VHF radio was not yet hooked up at the house, and he had no way of knowing what was going on. Over breakfast, I related the events of the previous 12 hours, and was a little concerned when I told him about the hole in the stern of the boat. He was just glad that we were unharmed. The boat could always be fixed. And back to the dock at 8.45 in the morning. All I wanted to do was turn in the paperwork and see my lovely wife and get some sleep. It was then I remembered that we had an in-harbour job scheduled for 9 o'clock that morning. Off we went. Well, I hope you enjoyed that adventure. It still gives Joel the shudders. Um, so... What can I say? Um, we'll all get through this craziness together. Be careful, be safe, be well, stay at home, wash your hands. And if you like my readings, please leave a note under the excuse me, YouTube videos or uh, and subscribe to my channel and, and like what I'm doing. And if you don't, that's okay too. There'll be another story next week. We're going to a different place. We're going up in the Himalaya Mountains. So, until next week, uh, enjoy spring. It's here. Take care. This is Captain John signing off.